Uh, we're looking at James chapter 2, verse 24, uh, in the right context. And you see there at the top of your page, it says that uh, this is the verse itself, that 224. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, does that sound like what a good Baptist would say? No, because we always talk about how you're saved by faith alone, right? Sola, uh, what, what, no, I was just sola, sola fide, uh, by faith alone, I think that's what that, what that was. And so that was the whole heart of the Reformation that happened, uh, you know, years and years ago, that you are saved by faith and not by works. And that's what we teach all the time. But then you get to check to James, and sometimes James can be really confusing. And uh, there's been people who... Uh, 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 didn't even back in the day whenever they were trying to decide what was the canon of scripture what things should be included there were some people in the early church who didn't even want to include James because it sounded like he was saying that you're saved by works and not by faith and so some people didn't even want to include James in the scriptures because it seemed counterintuitive to what uh, the gospel says and what Jesus would say and what Paul would say um, but whenever you really get an understanding of what James is saying uh, you can see that really it's, he's saying much of the same things. And so um, this verse uh, a lot of times is used uh, to say something like this. You are not saved by faith alone, but by faith and works. Uh, so some people will use this verse to, uh, to kind of say that. And, and different denominations will use this to kind of justify some of their doctrine or their belief systems. Um, some cults will even use this to justify some of their belief systems. Um, one example is the Mormon Church. The Mormon Church, uh, this is in their Doctrines and Covenants. It says, as with all other doctrines of salvation, justification is available because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ, but it becomes operative in the life of an individual only on conditions of personal righteousness. So in other words, what the Mormons believe is that they're st they've come to believe in three different levels of salvation and justification. First of all, they believe that Jesus' salvation, his uh, his uh, the, the salvation he gave us on the cross uh, is applied to everybody, regardless of your faith or your not having faith. So it is uh, applied equally uh, for everybody. And basically what that just means is we don't go to hell. Um, there's, there's no hell and you sort of vanish or you go to a certain level or something like that. Um, so Christ's atonement is applied to everybody, but your eternal salvation having a place with God or a place in eternal life, a, a position in eternal life, that's dependent upon your actions. So that's why it says here that um, justification is available because of the atoning work of Jesus, but it becomes operative in your life only on conditions of personal righteousness. So as long as you're a good person, a uh, good Mormon is really what that comes down to, then the effects of Jesus' salvation are really going to be applied to you. And so that kind of is based on some of that is based on this verse. Uh, then uh, some Christian churches or churches of Christ believe uh, in this in a certain direct, certain uh, extent. Uh, this is from their, uh, their belief system. In salvation of a man's soul, there are two necessary parts, God's part and man's part. Though God's part is the big part, man's part is also necessary if a man is to reach heaven. Man must comply with the conditions of pardon which the Lord has announced. You must hear the gospel, believe, repent of past sins, confess Jesus as Lord, be baptized for the remissions of sins, and live a Christian life. And so, um, now not all, I can't just paint a broad, you know, uh, category for Church of Christ, because some of them believe one way, and some of them believe another way. Uh, but in general, the historic doctrines of the Church of Christ, um, they, they believe, some of them believe that you can lose your salvation. Uh, and that in order to sustain or to keep your salvation, you have to live a godly life. You have to live according to certain godly principles that are found in the Word. And that if you stray away from that, you can lose your salvation. And I don't completely know uh, or understand what to what extent you can lose your salvation, how you can get your salvation back. If you, I know that you, uh, uh, old school, real traditional churches of Christ believe you had to be baptized in the Church of Christ in order for that salvation to be sealed. Um, so maybe it had to do something with getting rebaptized or a reconfession or something like that. Um, but they do have some of that back there in some of their, um, in some of their doctrines. And so um, we can see that even among Christians, there is some who believe that you're not just saved by faith, but you're also saved by, you're saved by faith and works. You have to have both of them. Um, and sometimes even we as Baptists 
can somewhat live that way. Um, you know, we, we will say things like, well, you know, you got to you, you gotta get saved, and you, you got to come to church, you got to give your offerings, you got to do this, got to do this, got to do this. And what we're, what we're really saying is that these are evidences of your salvation, but sometimes we live in a way where we think that those things are required, or we teach that those things are required. And so, you know, I like to show pictures here, but I couldn't find any cute little things on the wall that said, you're saved by works, not by faith. That's just not real popular. I guess they don't have those at Hobby Lobby. But I did find some comic strips that, that show this kind of mentality that's pretty prevalent in our culture. So here's one of them. It says, welcome to heaven. First thing we do is show you all the jokes you laughed at that you didn't actually get. It says, ha ha, whoa, I get it. Oh, wait a minute. This joke was at my expense, and I laughed at it like an idiot. And then the angel says, yep, that joke was by Lynn something. He actually went to hell for that very joke. And you see Lynn in hell for telling a joke. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of this, this, this idea to where if you're good, you get into heaven. If you're not good, you go to hell. Here's another one that says that. The guy says, I was a stand-up comic. How strict do you think they'll be on jokes about the Pope? And so he's hoping that that doesn't keep him out of heaven. Um, and the, the, guy, uh, the angel says, boy, you are this close to getting in until I check these photos on your Facebook, of you on Facebook. And so, you know, if you got to watch what you put up on social media, it could keep you out of heaven. <laughs> Be careful. Um, here's one that says, you were a believer, yes, but you skipped the whole not being a jerk about it part. And so, yeah, he was a believer, but he wasn't real good, so maybe he doesn't get into heaven. And then this one is, is uh, pretty, pretty clever. And it's oh. Michael Jackson standing in heaven, and the angel says, you're bad, beat it. And so, you know, so popular culture, you know, talks about if you're a good person, you go to heaven. If you're not a good person, <coughs> you go to hell. Have you ever seen a celebrity die and somebody talk about them on a talk show or somebody get up and talk at their funeral or something like that? Uh, do they, have you ever seen a, some, a celebrity die and somebody say, well, you know what, they just really weren't a good person, they're probably in hell. Have you ever heard anybody say that? No, it's always, they were such a good person, they gave to all these organizations, they tried to save the whales, they were advocates for children, um, they gave you know, tons of money to the Republican Party or to the Democratic Party or whoever. Um, they were just such a good person. I know that they're in a better place now. You know, that's the phrase we always say, they're in a better place now. It doesn't have anything to do with if they were a Christian or non-Christian. It's just they were a good person, so they have to be in heaven, right? And so that's really what, how this kind of works itself out in our culture. A lot of people think that if you're good, that you get into heaven. It's a works-based theology. So let's look at this um, verse in its uh, original context. So we're going to start in James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, and uh, read through the end of the chapter. Okay? So James 2, 14 through 26. James writes, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such a faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith, show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one, good. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. Senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac as his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. All right, so that's the whole passage of Scripture we're going to look at. So just kind of walking through this, James begins by asking this thematic question for the section. What good is faith if it isn't accompanied by works? Can it be a saving faith? And so James's question is, is basically, can you say that you have faith, but not demonstrate that you have faith and still be saved? Can you say, yes, I have faith in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. He's my Savior. He's changed my life. But give no outward demonstration that that has actually taken place. And so can you have faith 
without works and still be saved, okay? And that's where this question gets us sometimes because we think, okay, well, I have to have faith and I have to have works in order to be saved. And so then salvation must really be about faith and works. That's kind of where the, where the hang-up kind of comes into play. Um, that's where the Mormon church kind of gets hung up on it. Um, I had an interview with some uh, Mormon missionaries one time, and I asked them about Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, where it says that you're saved by faith, not by works. And they said that their interpretation of that verse is that you're saved by faith after you've done everything that you can do. So basically the way that they picture it is God, as long as you are trying your hardest, God is always going to fill your cup. And so, you know, just assume that in order to get to heaven, you've, you've, got, a, you've got a gallon bucket. In order to get to heaven, you've got to fill your bucket, your gallon bucket full of good works. All right? That's the goal. To get to heaven, it's got to be full. Well, let's say you fill it, you know, three-fourths full, and that's all that you can do in your life. Well, Jesus will fill in the other fourth to, to finish out your, your good works. If you try your best and all you get is halfway, Jesus will fill your halfway. If you try your hardest and all you get is a fourth of the way, Jesus will fill it in. So, so they're trying to balance this idea of faith and works in a way that makes sense for them. But what we need to realize, and what we're going to see here in a little bit, is that, that faith and works are not required. That's not the requirement for salvation, but it is an evidence of salvation. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. And so then James gives a practical illustration of a faith claim that doesn't have accompanying works. He concludes that the words in the illustration are useless, just like a workless faith is useless. And so he tells this illustration, If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. And so um, he's just picturing this, this illustration. You know, and, and it's one of those things where it's kind of a... Uh, ridiculous kind of illustration James does this in his letter uh, like earlier in the letter he says um, someone who looks into the law but then doesn't do what it says is like a man who looks in the mirror and then goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like um, and that, that's a ridiculous statement nobody looks in the mirror turns around and immediately forgets what they look like right especially image conscious people like us Americans you know we can look in the mirror and for the rest of the day we're conscious of that zit that was on our face, you know, or that imperfection that was on our face, or how tired our eyes look. We think about it all day long, you know, because we don't want people to look at us and, and recognize those things. We always remember what we look like. And so that was a ridiculous point that Paul, that James was making. If you look into the law and then just completely go and do opposite of what it says, that you're a fool. Well, it's the same thing here. He's kind of given a ridiculous scenario. <coughs> if that a brother or sister, not just a stranger, but somebody that's a part of my community, my faith community, comes up and they're hungry, they don't have adequate clothes, they don't have shelter, and I say, brother, go, go, go put on some clothes, go get you some food, go get a warm place to stay, be blessed, my brother, and then I send them on their way, and I haven't done them any good. No, because if they could feed themselves, they already would have. If they could clothe themselves, they already would have. If they could shelter themselves, they already would have. And so he's saying, look, your words in that illustration, those words are empty. They're meaningless. They have no result. They do no good for you or for that person. And so he's kind of given this illustration to show that a workless faith um, is, is useless. Then he calls the question someone claiming to have faith who's not concerned with works. He says simple faith in the doctrine of God is not good enough. So he says there, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. He says, you believe that God is one? Good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. And so some people, and we have this even in our culture and we have this even in our churches today. They say, absolutely, I believe in Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the only Son of God. He died on the cross for my sins, and I know that if I have faith in Him, trust in Him, believe in Him, uh, that He will forgive my sins, and, uh, and one of these days when I die, I'll go to be with Him in heaven. We can say that all day long, but just knowing and acknowledging that doctrine doesn't save, doesn't save us. Okay, That doesn't save us. I can acknowledge that, and I can say that all day long. But if it hasn't made a change in my heart, then I haven't accepted that. It hasn't become a part of who I am. I haven't accepted that by faith, and now I'm, that faith is producing fruit in my life. 
And the reason I know that that's the, the, that we can know that he's talking about knowing doctrines is because James's reference right here uh, in verse 19 is to the Shema, the foundational point of belief for Jewish faith found in Deuteronomy 6.4. So in Deuteronomy 6.4, um, Moses is recount, recount, uh, recounting all the laws and all the teachings uh, to the Israelites before he leaves them and, and dies, and they go off into the promised land. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. <coughs> then he continues and says, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, You can teach this to your fa family when you're in your house, when you're on the road, when you wake up, when you go to sleep, when you're eating. And, you know, it's just this is the core teaching of the Jewish faith that there is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And so James says right here, you believe that God is one? Good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. And so basically what he's saying is, look, just knowing about God or understanding core doctrines about God, like that God is one, you know, that core elemental faith doctrine of the Jewish faith that everything else is built upon, great. I'm glad you know that. Even the demons know that. <laughs> Even the demons believe that God is one God. But that's not good enough for faith. That's not good enough for salvation got to be more than just knowing about God. And I'm afraid that in our churches today, we have a lot of people that know all about God, but it hasn't made a difference in their life. They're not living out faith. They just have an understanding of who God is or a knowledge of who God is. There's got to be more than head knowledge. And we talk about head knowledge and heart knowledge. we got to get out of head knowledge and get to a place where it's affected our heart. And so then James continues um, uh, to try to illustrate his point. Uh, that faith without works cannot save you. He says, since this person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? And so he talks at the beginning about how faith cannot save, or faith without works can't save you. Then he uses this illustration of Abraham's action to offer Isaac as an example of faith and action working together. Uh, so he says, Abraham, our father, was justified by works and offering Isaac as his son, his son on the altar. You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was filled that it says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so he uses that story of Abraham taking Isaac up onto the mountain to offer him uh, as a sacrifice to the Lord, because that's what the Lord commanded him to do. Uh, and if you know the rest of the story, God provided a ram, a substitute, so that he wouldn't have to sacrifice Isaac. But he was willing to obey God. And James says he was justified by that action. And then James again states that faith alone cannot save you. He says it again. You see that as a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And then he gives a second example. And this example is the example of Rahab. And she also, she proved her faith by her actions. She freed the, the slave or the, um, uh, the spies, helped them to escape and go out by another route. And so she said, he says that she was justified by her works in uh, receiving the messengers and sending them out. And so his conclusion in this whole section is there in that last verse, uh, is that faith without accompanying works is useless and dead. All right, so that's his, that's his conclusion here in this scripture, that faith without accompanying works is useless and dead. And so this can be pretty confusing. You know, because it seems like it's saying that if you don't have faith and you don't do good works, that you're not saved. So it seems to be saying that we are, at least in part, saved by our works. So if I don't, if I don't get out there and do something good, you know, do something good for the Lord, then, that, then I'm not going to be saved. I'm not going to have that saving faith element. And so let's, let's figure out that's really what this is saying. The way we're going to do that is by looking at the larger context, um, which isn't the Tasso that was last last time's thing, but what it says there on your paper, uh, faith and works in the New Testament, okay, so we're going to look just kind of through the, the four main writers of the New Testament, or main characters of the New Testament, you got Jesus in the Gospels, you got Paul in his, all of his letters, um, we're going to skip over James, that's what we're already talking about, then we have Peter and John, let's see what they all have to say about faith and works in the New Testament, so Jesus, first of all, Jesus gave examples of Workless faith and faithless works. Okay? I'll explain what I mean by these. Jesus gave examples of workless faith and faithless works. And so we can see that a workless faith is no good, 
and a faithless work is no good, according to Jesus. So the first one, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 through 23. He says, On that day many of you will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. And so these are guys who are going to come to Jesus at the end of time. They're going to say, look, we prophesied, we taught in your name, we drove out demons in your name, we did miracles in your name. And Jesus is not even going to let them into heaven. But does he, but he tells us why he doesn't let them into heaven, right? He doesn't say, you didn't do good enough. You didn't do enough good works. You can't come into heaven. No, he says, "Depart! Uh, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of laws, or lawbreakers. And so the, the reason they don't get into heaven is not because they didn't do enough good works. I mean, they've done some works that I haven't done. Any of you thrown out demons yet? in your life, you better get to it because apparently that's not even good enough to, to get into heaven. And so they've done some things that, man, I haven't even done and almost nine, you know, probably 99% of the people in the yeah. world today have never done, but they couldn't even get into heaven. But it wasn't because they didn't do enough good works. It's because they didn't know Jesus. Jesus says, I don't know you. I don't have a relationship with you. And so we can go through the motions day in and day out and do all the good things. We can come to church, we can run our tithe checks out, we can sing songs, we can, you know, volunteer for the you know kids or for this or that. We can do all kinds of good things, but never surrender our heart over to Christ. We can go through the motions, put on the face. Um, I've, I've thought it's funny how um, even growing up, I could recognize this, and I've seen it some in churches that I've served in too, that whenever it comes around uh, election time, all of a sudden you see those folks in your church maybe are running for office, they start getting a little bit more consistent in their membership or in their attendance. You know, because here in the South, especially uh, in the Deep South, it, it kind of matters if you are, uh, you know, going to church or not. And so they want to, you want to be seen as being active in church, you know, and, you know, holding babies in church or whatever, and, you know, seeing people in church. And so it's kind of a cultural thing. So they go through that motion of doing the churchy thing, but there's no faith behind it. And so that would be a, uh, a faithless work. Uh, but then he says, another verse, Matthew 25, says, Then too they will answer, Lord, when did, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for me, for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous in eternal, into eternal life. And so he compares the righteous and the unrighteous. And the righteous are people who had faith or you know, professed faith, but then they also had works to back that up. They fed people. They clothed people. They helped those who were needy. And then there's going to be those people who claim faith, but they don't have any works to justify or to, to demonstrate that they had a faith. Okay? And so Jesus is basically saying here, look, you profess that you have faith. You claim that you have faith, but your life has never demonstrated that you had this faith. There's never been any kind of work, any kind of fruit to show that you truly did have this faith. Okay, so Jesus compares these two things. He gives examples of a workless faith that doesn't save and a faithless work that doesn't save. So we have to be aware of those two things. Another thing about Jesus is that he rewarded the thief on the cross's faith with a promise of paradise even when there was no hope of accompanying works. Okay? And this is, this is one of the key things parts of scripture that really talks about shows us that it is the faith in Christ that saves us not faith plus works because there was nothing that the thief could do in that moment he confessed faith in Jesus he said Lord remember me when you enter your kingdom and Jesus said I tell you the truth today you will be with me in paradise and so he was able to profess faith in Jesus to you know ask for Jesus to give him salvation and right there, at that very instant, Jesus said, you've got it. You have eternal life. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And that, 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 um, that thief had no opportunity to get down off the cross and prove himself to Jesus. You know, to get down on the cross and go volunteer in the children's church or you know, something like that. Or go help a needy person or give something to a beggar or, or um, you know, anything like that. He had no opportunity. He was going to be dead in a matter of hours. But Jesus said... Basically, because of your faith, you're going to be with me in paradise today. And so that faith was what 
gave him salvation. That faith in Jesus is what initiated that salvation. So he was rewarded the thief on the cross with the promise of paradise. And then Jesus also said that works, um, fruit, I'll put in parentheses, fruit, are visible evidence of a person's true condition. Okay? Works, those that fruit, uh, are visible evidence of a person's true condition. Um, and he says this in Matthew 7, Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ravaging wolves, or you'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistle, figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you will recognize them by their fruit. And so Jesus made it very clear that the way that you can tell a genuine prophet, in this, in this case, a genuine prophet versus a false prophet, is by their fruit. And so they may look the part, they may even say the part, but you look at their life and see if it matches up with what they're claiming. And that's how you'll be able to know if they truly are from the Lord or not. And it's the same way in our life. We should be able to tell if we truly have a genuine, true faith by the things that we do in our life, the way that it comes out in our life. Um, Paul, moving on to Paul. Paul teaches that salvation is by faith alone or apart from works. Okay? Faith alone or apart from works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. And so Paul makes a very clear distinction between uh, faith that saves you um, and, and works. And then he goes on to talk about how we are Christ, uh, God's workmanship created to do good works, but we weren't saved by works. And he says you're not saved by works, you're created to do good works. Okay? You're not saved by works. You were created for works, to accomplish tasks. And you are, so you're not saved by, your, that you, so you are saved by faith alone, according to Paul. And then he also writes that uh, works are evidence of a spirit-filled life. So works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of you. He says this in Galatians 5.22. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. And so uh, just above that, he gives the works of the flesh. He, he, he lays them out. Then he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And so somebody who has the Spirit is going to demonstrate these things in their life. Uh, he's going to demonstrate love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, we may not demonstrate those in a perfect way. I mean, there may be times where uh, we're lacking in self-control. I'm not sure this is exactly what Paul is talking about, but next week on Thursday, I will not be exhibiting self-control. Um, there's going to be a lot, a big lack of self-control next Thursday, whenever that big old tub, pot, whatever, uh, chicken and dressing is sitting there in front of me, and there's some pies over on the counter, some mashed potatoes. Um, I'm going to probably exhibit a lack of self-control about three or four times. You know, uh, and, and we're, we're talking the big plates, you know, the oval plates. Anybody feeling me? I mean, you're with me there? Okay. Um, so I will be exhibiting a lack of self-control. I'm not exactly sure that's what Paul is talking about. Um, but that does give us, in a funny way, uh, very, the realization that we may not exhibit these fruits of the Spirit all the time in a perfect way. Um, there may be times where you let Satan steal your joy, and you're just having a bad day, and you're not expressing the joy of the Lord. Uh, does that mean you lost your salvation? No, that just means that you've probably lost a little bit of your victory today. You need to get that back. Um, you know, to get back in uh, with, with, with the Lord on that. Um, there's some days where we lose our self-control. There's some times when you lose your gentleness, right? And if you've got kids, you've, you've fallen in that part, right? You know, at some time when you lose the gentleness. Um, and so, yeah, we may not have those perfect all the time. But as long as that is a consistent evidence, and you're going to be strong in some and weak in others. But as long as, as a whole, you can express some of those um, on a consistent basis. Um, and that's evidence that you are a uh, believer, that you have been saved by faith. Peter. Uh, Peter, in his letter, he links faith and works. Uh, with, and he says that works are the evidence of faith in our lives. And they are the confirmation that we have a final destination in heaven. Okay, So he, he kind of ties heaven to it. Let me read this passage. Um, it's there on your page. It says, for this very reason, we make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness. Uh, or, sorry, for this re very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, 
goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. And so going back up to the first part of that passage, it says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness. And what is a supplement? You, some, of you, some of you guys probably take uh, medicines or vitamins that are supplements. Uh, some of you, uh, if you're uh, on, if you're uh, retired and over 65, you might be on uh, Medicare, but you might have a supplemental health plan. That word supplement is means it's adding something into it, right? It's bolstering, it's boosting, it's supporting. Okay, so he says support or supplement or add into your faith with goodness, faith, and knowledge, and all that, all those kind of stuff. And he says that, so it's something that you add to that faith, it's something that bolsters in that faith, it's something that feeds into that faith, that demonstrates um, what's going on in your life. It says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so these faith and works uh, are evidence of the faith that is in our life. The faith already exists. And then finally, John. John says that mere confession of faith without resulting obedience is a false confession. He says, if we say, sorry, I did that kind of fast. Um, so a mere confession of faith without resulting obedience is a false confession. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. And so if you say that you have faith, if you say that you have fellowship with him, yet you walk in darkness, you are a liar. You're not truly a believer. Yes. You back up the slide? Yeah, sure will. Still underlying. No problem. No problem. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Those are big. Those are big ones right now. Uh, so the fellowship. Uh, if you say you have fellowship, you verbally profess that you have fellowship, but then you continually walk in sin, then you're proving that you're a liar. That's what he's saying. He's saying you're proving that you don't have real faith, that you don't have genuine saving faith. And so what he's saying is not that you have to have works to be saved. He's saying that the works are evidence of your salvation. And so we can look at Jesus, we can look at Paul, we can look at Peter, and we can look at John. And all four of those other primary writers and characters, Jesus being the character of the Gospels, all those other primary sources of, in the New Testament tell us very clearly that you're saved by faith, and that the works in your life are evidence of that faith. Okay? And so, going back to James, okay? Going back to James, because that's really where the confusion kind of comes in. Um, we kind of can get this understanding that a true faith is a faith that works. And so James's point, and the point of the New Testament, is that a claim of faith is not accompanied, uh, a claim of faith that is not accompanied by faith-fueled action is an empty it is not genuine saving faith. Okay? So let me say that again. Try to say it more clearly. If you claim to have faith, if you profess faith with your mouth, is really what James is picturing here. If you claim to have faith, but there are no works to accompany that faith, faith-filled works that accompany that faith, then it's an empty claim. It's not genuine saving faith. And so you have to... Uh, you have to make the claim of faith, but you also have to have a spirit-filled outpouring of that in your life. And I say a spirit-filled outpouring because, like I said earlier, we can go through the motions, right? We can make it look like we've really got it together and we're really following up the Lord. But if we're not stepping out in faith in our life in obedience to some, some, some things, you know, feeling like maybe we're getting to the edge and God's pushing us over a little bit, you know, to, to step out in faith on Him. It could just be... Faith in finances, faith in relationships, faith in a job or a career, uh, faith in service in some way, um, then we, we need to consider if we truly have a genuine faith. These examples of Abraham and Rahab show people who had developed faith in Yahweh, 
and then that faith resulted in obedient action. Okay, and so you think about Abraham especially. He had already demonstrated for a long time that he had faith in God, right? Because God said, I want you to leave your homeland and go to a place where I will show you. And so in other words, uh, Abraham, I want you to go to another place. I'll be your GPS, but you don't get to see the final destination. You don't get to see that last mark on the map. You just keep walking, and I'll tell you when we get there. <laughs> and so that was a, an exhibit, exhibition of faith that Abraham showed in Yahweh, in God. He went ahead and started marching out in faith. And so he already had faith. He wasn't justified because he went to offer Isaac on the mountain. That was just an example of something that he had been living out for a long time already in his life. Um, and so he, he had already been, been exhibiting that. Uh, Rahab, uh, do you remember what she said when the spies came into her, her house? You know, she, she welcomed them in, she hid them, and she said, all of Jericho is trembling because we know that your God has already given you the city. So in other words, she already understood who Yahweh was. She already had complete confidence that Jericho was going to fall because God, Yahweh, is the greatest God. She had already developed faith, trust, a, a trust in that God. She knew that that God was better. And so she was willing to do, she was willing to abandon the gods of Jericho and get on board with Yahweh in the hopes that it would lead to salvation for her. And so she already had a faith in, in God. And because of that faith, she helped and protected spies. And so these examples show somebody who had developed faith that resulted in action. And so um, this is the, the last point that's probably the one that needs to be the, cleared up the most. Um, when James speaks of being justified, he doesn't mean the same thing that Paul does. Whenever we talked about being justified uh, by faith, usually we go to Paul. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, we go to Paul's letters and he talks about justification. <laughs> Uh, and uh, whenever I, I think about justification, the way I always illustrate it to people is that justification means that it's just as if I never sinned. And okay? whenever you're justified before the Lord, it's just as if I'd never sinned. And so that's what, it, that's what it means. Whenever you are justified by faith, God wipes your slate clean. And when before God, whenever he looks at you, you are an innocent person. You're an innocent person on the stand, an innocent person on trial. He looks at you and it's just as if you had never sinned because all that sin has been poured on Jesus Christ and put on his back, on his shoulders, um, there on the cross. And so whenever Paul speaks about justification, he's, and he says that you are justified by faith, he, uh, he says that you are justified by faith apart from keeping the law. So P Paul, when he writes, he's writing to audiences who are trying to figure out how much of the law do I have to keep versus living by faith. And especially Galatians. Galatians is all about that. How much do, you, do I have to keep on the Jewish law in order to be saved, or am I saved by faith? And okay, that's, that's, Galatians is all up in the air on that. And so whenever Paul says that you're justified apart from the law, he's saying, look, for all this past time, we had to keep the law. We had to make sacrifices, make sacrifices, make sacrifices. And the whole point of that was to show that you can't be good enough. You can't ever keep the law perfectly. You know, if you, I mean, just think about it. You get your goat. You go up to the to the you know to the temple. You offer your goat to to sacrifice you know to sacrifice your cow or your turtle doves or whatever you could afford, and you uh, um, you know you, you've had some sin in your life, so you're trying to cleanse that. You go through the, the process. They sacrifice the goat. You know you put your head on it, your hand on it. Your sins are atoned for, and the priest says your your sin's been atoned for. You can go back home. So you're all on your way out. And on the way outside of the temple, you stub your toe and you say a four-letter word. Man, you know what you just did? You just sinned again. So now what do you have to do? You gotta go get another goat. <laughs> you gotta come back, you know, and sacrifice it again. And then when you get home, you know, your kid has he's broken the cookie jar again, and you get all may get mad at him and don't act very, I would say Christian, but this is the Old Testament. So you don't act like a good Israelite. And you know what you got to do? You got to get another goat. Before long, you're going to run out of goats, right? So the whole point of the Old Testament law was to point, there's got to be something better. And that something better is faith in God, trusting that only God can really cover over your sins. And so Paul's point is that you're justified by faith in God, not by the law. You got these, these, are the, these are the two options we have, faith or keeping God's law. And he says you're justified by faith, not by law. Whenever James is talking, James means just that you're justified by works as evidence of a genuine faith. 
In other words, a faith claim that is verified by verifiable evidence. So whenever James talks about being justified, he's not talking about law or faith, law or faith, okay? He's talking about that you are making a claim of faith, okay? So you're already to the point where you realize that you've got to be saved by faith, okay? They're, you're already making that claim. Because he says, you know, some people say I have works, some people say I have faith. He recognizes that people already know that they've got to make a faith claim about God, a faith claim about Jesus. But what Paul, James is trying to get to the point is, <clears throat> what is backing up that faith claim? Okay? What, is, what is the evidence for that faith claim? And so he says that these things have to be verifiable by empirical, empirical evidence. And so he says, um, in the same way, so he says it three different times. In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. He says in verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. He says in verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Okay, so give us an example that we can really kind of understand clearly, okay? Let's say that your husband or your wife tells you every single day, I love you. I love you, honey. I love you, sweetheart. I love you, babe. But they never do anything to show you that they love you. They never give you a hug, they never give you a kiss, they never help you in the kitchen, they never help you outside in the yard, uh, they never pick up after themselves, they never do anything that shows that they love you. Do they love you? No. I mean, you can say it all day, right? I mean, we used to, used to tell teenagers that all the time. Look, doesn't matter what that boy tells you, honey, he doesn't love you. <laughs> He's telling you all the things that he, want, he thinks you want to hear, so that he can get what he wants to get. That's what, you know, teenagers are, get, have that dilemma all the time. You can say things all day long, but those things are verified by action. And so what James is saying, he's saying, you're not, it's not that he's saying you're justified by doing works. He's saying that your, your claim is verified by doing those works. And so faith leads to works. Faith that is real exemplifies or gives evidence of itself in works. And so whenever he talks about Abraham being justified by, uh, by that action, he's saying, look, the, the faith that Abraham already had was verified by that action. And so there's a two different kinds of justification that's really kind of going on here. And so it's, um, it's just like if I say that I love Melody, that claim is going to be justified or verified by the things that I do. And so it's kind of, this is a good chart that I found that kind of shows this. Paul says in Romans 3, 28, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And he's pointing to justifying faith before he did any works because he believed God's promises. And then James over here, he's saying in James 2, 24, You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So James is simply saying that anybody can say they have faith. If your faith in Christ is genuine, it will manifest itself. And then the misinterpretation, you know, are you saved by works and faith, or are you saved by faith alone that exemplifies itself in, in works? Um, and so the question, the answer is no. Faith is always the basis of salvation, and works are always the proof of salvation. So faith is always the basis of salvation, and works are always the proof of salvation. And so nowhere in Scripture does it say that you're saved by, by works. But in, in, in we're talking New Testament. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say that you're saved by your works. And so uh, hopefully that can help us understand what that verse there, James 2.24, means in its original context.